Hello and welcome back to Making It. My name is Mirabelle, and today on the podcast we have Hamish Thompson. He's the composer for Chesapeake Shores on Hallmark, which just recently wrapped up with six seasons. We met at VIF, the Vancouver International Film Festival AMP Accelerator program, where he did a town hall panel with some other composers, including Stephen Letness, who was on the last episode, so be sure to give that a listen as well if you haven't already. I think Hamish has experienced all sorts of genres, and he has this ability to pull from all of them. His musical journey has spanned from songwriting, to record deals, touring, to composing for film and television. He speaks about being able to pour all of his emotions into all of these projects after experiencing such a great deal of loss. And it's incredible to hear how open he is to sharing about all of that and how he's just so trusting in the process, in the universe, that everything happens for a reason. So it's okay. It's it's okay that he's lost loved ones. And one thing that I really liked that he said in the episode is how they're still around him. Even though they're not physically on this earth anymore, there are still ways that he can kind of reach them. It's also just really awesome to hear how he has such a great outlook on life, even though he has gone through so much grief, he's still able to enjoy all the little things in life. We touch on dyslexia and how that's affected his music, imposter syndrome, and also this thing called synesthesia, which is where some people can hear frequencies when they see a certain color, and it's very interesting. So hopefully you learn a thing or two from this, or just simply enjoy listening to somebody speak about their experiences not limiting it to just music, but life as well. I mean, everything is intertwined after all. Please rate and review this podcast wherever you're listening. You can watch this on YouTube as well if you didn't know, and clips are being posted daily on all the social platforms. I would love to hear what you thought of the episode of the podcast as a whole. Check out the links below to find social links to the podcast, myself, and Hamish. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Hamish. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Making It. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a a real real pleasure. Yeah. Um, I keep starting these podcasts with like how we met. And a lot of the guests this season are composers that I met at VIF, the Vancouver International Film Festival. And the episode before this one is with Stephen Letness. So I was we were talking about the town hall that you guys did. Mm -hmm. That was really inspiring for me. Yeah, it was a good chat. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, he's he's a inspiring person and uh, just great to chat with and great to you know talk talk shop, but also talk talk life, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And you've got a lot of life too. <laughs> talk about. <laughs> yeah, I sure do, and I, I'm happy to share. You know, it's uh, mm-hmm. not a straight line, and we all have our own path, right? How we get to where we are, but. It's just it always winds. It's never like a direct path to where I think I'm going to wind up. I may wind up there, but not mm. the way I thought I was going to get there. Yeah. And yeah. I'm cool with that, right? It's like you find magic around every corner and new experiences. And, um, you know, with, with composing, I feel like having life experiences that are rich and meaningful for me, mm-hmm. help me, help me do better work how we have inspiration oh, yeah. and that also have balance, right? Have balance in my life of the work schedule. And it can be a bit of a grind, but to carve out that time for family and loved ones and friends mm. and experiences, like all, all enhances the work. So. Yeah. yeah. What, what kind of stuff do you like to do when you're not composing and make music? That's a good question. I, um, I live in North Vancouver, so I'm surrounded by there's the ocean five minutes away then there's three mountains five minutes away so uh i find myself uh, often in, in the forest i love the forest and there's a particular park in in west vancouver called lighthouse park so mm. that's the spot where i feel most sort of grounded and when i first went there years ago i i, I live in north vancouver grew up in powell river which was just up the coast from vancouver 
And I remember when I came, I was 18, going to music school. I came down to North Vancouver and I found this park. So I called someone, I heard someone say Lighthouse Park and White Cliff mm-hmm. Park. So I went there and I just felt, I don't know, just felt like uh, I'd been there before. It's kind of a weird, Ooh. weird, hard, hard to like put into words, but there's a feeling where I felt really connected to this park. So it's been something that's been in my life since I've been 18. and. Oh, that's magical. <laughs> yeah, going through music school and all my work and then my own kids bringing them there. And yeah, so that's what I love to go there. So mm. when I'm not uh, working, but I also love doing, you know, whip down to Seattle, go to, you know, like road, like weekend road trips. I love. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm big into playing uh, Frisbee and good by bowling or like. Do whatever you know, ult- ultimate frisbee you know what i've never done ultimate oh okay. have you no have you? <laughs> yeah i look at it and i think that would be pretty fun but i just haven't done it mm, yeah yeah uh, uh love reading when i can it's like but I, i'm dyslexic so for for me reading takes a little longer and so when i when i read a small small novel it's like an epic five <laughs> oh, yeah. five five book series to me because i just take my time and i reread just to make sure it sinks in, you know, and uh, so I do like to do that if I, you know, carve out that space. That's, yeah. that's so fun. <laughs> I love I love laughing, being silly too, right? Like, don't take oh, yeah. things too seriously. And, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Also, you, when you mentioned love being in forests and and lighthouse park, there, there's a big thing in my community, my little online community, where because um, I was doing live compositions on Twitch for a, a while and. Anytime I ask the chat, like, what does this remind you of? Or like, what should we call this short, tiny little piece? Forest would always be in the title. Mm, That's cool. (laughs) Yeah. And so uh, we have like a forest counter now. (laughs) Oh, that's fun. I'd love to hear some of your work. That'd be great. Yeah. I also have a song called Lighthouse. So. Oh, wow. That's that's Mm. cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Can you take us back a little bit? Just like a little history of how you got to where you are now maybe sure it's uh i mean it's a lot but <laughs> yeah there's a lot there so i may ramble a bit now but it's just you know ramble it's like away. P- putting the p- like connecting all the dots i love hearing about how people got to where they are too and um yeah so i, I grew up in in powell river which small town i think it's maybe eighteen thousand people at the, the the biggest like amount of people um, and that was in the, you know, late sixties, early seventies, it's a mill town. So the big pulp and paper mill was like the, the, the foundation there, but there's lots of, it's kind of a very artistic town and lots of hippies there, like draft dodgers from the sixties. And so it was a pretty eclectic spot to grow up. And, um, my, my beginning into music, uh, came through scottish music the uh, oh. like a pipe band the local powell river pipe band so the mill was is interesting because the mill was run by mick millen blodell back in the day and i guess they went out and they they found a bunch of people in scotland to offer them work in this mill and if they played the bagpipes or the like the side drum they would give them like a, a I don't know, like free ride to, to Canada and, and work at this mill. So they started this pipe band. And then uh, my dad grew up in North Vancouver. He played bagpipes and wound up getting a job in Powell River as a high school teacher. Mm. And connected with, with the, the Scottish community up there. And that's how I started my music career, because the local pipe band it was called the Klansman Pipe Band. They needed drummers. They had tons of pipers. And my dad's like, I was six. And he's like, hey, son. He puts his hand on my shoulder. I totally remember this. He's like, um, we need drummers in the band. You're going to be a drummer. And I just remember, like, what, I am? Okay. Okay, fine. I'm going to be a drummer. I didn't really know what that meant at the time, obviously. But um, looking back, I had this amazing uh, mentor, teacher, who was the, the main drummer in that pipe band. Phil McMillan was his name. Um, who just taught me how to feel music and how to like, cause when you, when you look at pipe band music, 
like bagpipes are really, uh, in my opinion, quite a difficult instrument, physically mm-hmm. and mentally and technically. Um, and also the, the side drum stuff is like really detailed stuff. And I remember trying to read the music. I just, because I couldn't compute. I didn't know I was dyslexic at the time. I just remember seeing like a blur of notes. And I was like, okay, if there's lots of notes, I go fast. If there's like a little scoop over it and a big face, there's like either a drum roll or a pause. And I remember uh, Phil just being really patient with me and and teaching me how to feel feel the music. Don't worry about having to play technically everything because I have a really good memory because I work uh, being dyslexic. I can watch people and and pick up sort of uh, muscle memory rhythms and stuff like that. Rather than mm-hmm. reading, I can watch stuff and and internalize a pattern. So that really helped me. I loved it. I fell in love with like this side drum and I became really, you know, quite into it. And, and Scottish like pipe band culture is like all about competitions and you go to like, you compete with people and you, it, it's like the Highland games, right? Like the caber toss and like all this stuff. And then there's the, the individual like side drum competition or just the pipers and stuff like that. So that was a huge part of my, my start into loving music and understanding, you know, how to, how to listen. That's what I really loved about uh, one thing that Phil taught me was how to listen and not, mm-hmm. cause you can play the same music, same beat, same rhythm, same, but if you don't listen to who you're playing with, it might sound like it's on a grid, but if you can create something together, it it gets into territory where you can't necessarily uh, name it. Mm. You can just feel it. It's, it's interesting that your f- first experience of learning music and playing music is with a group, like with other people, because lots of people start learning piano or whatever it is, and it's like taking lessons, they're learning by themselves, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, that's interesting. That is interesting, actually, because, you know, in the pipe band, there's probably 15 pipers. And then there's a tenor drum with the bigger stick, the mallets that they swing and the the bass drum. And then there's usually maybe five side drums, which is what Mm -hmm. I was doing. So, yeah, just to be that cohesive, almost like being in a choir. Yeah. You have to be in tune with each other and make, make the magic. Yeah, that really levels up musicianship i think yeah yeah me too so from there i um i i started playing like the drum set in i think maybe like grade 10 something like that i was like what is this thing like all these i was so into it i'm getting (laughs) school band and then i decided to go to music school at uh in north vancouver at cap college at the time so when i graduated from high school i went to to music school and I just I always knew when I was a kid I just I just didn't have the sense that there was something else out there for me because I just knew somehow that music was going to be it mm. and I just just had this, this sense of knowing and being you know getting lots of extra help with math lots of extra help with reading and I <laughs> kind of struggled with those kind of topics and but I just had this I never really panicked because I knew I had this this thing that I needed to do like this bigger picture thing so um yeah came down to Vancouver went to music school for a few years and and got into some bands you know so we did that that kind of that was my world like being in a band and playing gigs and going on tour and so that was that was fun you know to have that experience and having a van and we're gonna we're <laughs> driving down to California we're, or we're driving to Toronto or 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 Calgary, you know, like, but that yeah. was one of our big loops is to up to Calgary and back. And so that was like really, really precious time. You know, I really appreciate those years. And um, yeah, so from there, I, I, you know, I had this feeling that being in this band was, was awesome and touring. And then I had a feeling that I, I wanted to, it was kind of getting into more like DJ based, like <laughs> trip, trip hop drum and bass i was really inspired by that kind of stuff like whatever was happening in the uk so i had a feeling to make a a record that was going to be just a 
in my mind, just a breakbeat record, just drum grooves for people, for DJs to use or bands to use to put into their own mixes. So I, I booked some time. This is the first time I'd gone into the studio by myself. It's always been with bands and, you know, being a, a session drummer or whatever. Um, so I remember going into the studio and doing these beats that were in my mind. And then I just would hear a bass line. Then I would hear some keyboards and hear patterns and, and these just beats turned into these full fledged songs. And it was such a freeing experience to not be in a band and just, just <laughs> let out what was, what was happening to me at whatever was wherever I was at at that time. And it was, uh, yeah, it was like super freeing and really, really fun to not have uh, pressure from other people. Mm. Not that it, like I felt pressure from like being in the band, but it just felt free. So I yeah. um, made this, this turn into a record and it's, it's kind of like, you know, atmospheric, ambient, but trip hop, beat driven, you know, inspired by bands like the Massive Attack and stuff like that. Sort of like there was like a bit of grittiness to it as well and experimenting. And then I, what happened was I started doing some shows, um, hired like my buddies that were in the bands I had played in. It's like, Hey, I've got this thing going on. Do you want to jam with me? And like, mm -hmm. so we did that. And we, we played some shows and it started to kind of gather some steam. And I remember doing, uh, make made press my own records and kind of, I had some motivation to, to do that. There's a place in Vancouver called the Planetarium, which is where they have like the light sh show, the laser light show on the ceiling. It's it's like a pretty iconic place, and I decided that that would be a pretty fun place to do a show, to like yeah. my, my debut show for like releasing this record. And and what happened was, um, you know, just by doing some shows and being in the scene, Network Records, which is based out of Vancouver got wind of what I was doing and someone came to that show and then they offered me a record deal. And so I, I was like blown away. Like, cause you know, you took all those years of touring and doing all that stuff as an indie artist. And then to finally do my own thing, which was kind of eclectic beyond the, the band stuff. I got offered a, a deal, which was really awesome. Right. And I felt that it kind of was a, um, another, like I was fine. Like with my career, it's like there's plateaus. You get mm. to a spot and you do your thing. Then you like, you just jump up a bit and you do another thing. You jump up a bit and you do the next bit. So definitely a bigger plateau for me to, to reach. And from there, that's when I started getting people being interested in the, like the soundscapey quality of some of that music to, to license for TV and film. So that was my first thing. I was like, Oh, okay. But, but to, just to actually to backtrack a little bit, when I signed my, my first record deal with Network, you have the, the first meeting with the, you know, the president and stuff like that. And they're like, what are you, president of, of Network Records? Um, <laughs> <the> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, what do you see? Where do you see your career going? What do you, what do you want to do? And I, I just blurted out oh i love how Stuart copeland from the police how his career went he was in the band then he started doing all these incredible soundtracks i was like mm -hmm. i can see myself getting into like doing soundtracks one day and i had never really thought about it it just came out <laughs> and they were like oh okay well we expect you to be like wanting to make lots of records and tour yeah and it's so but they kind of like re uh rejigged the the, the feeling of hiring me as a, or signing yeah. me as an artist, which they were still totally into because they mm. saw an opportunity to start licensing some of my music. So yeah, that was the start into composing for film and TV. Yeah. I, I'm curious to hear also like maybe later, like about what it's like to be signed with a record label, because we have had different independent artists on here who have, you know, have had some really positive things to say and some, not so positive things to say some people are really for it some people are really against it yeah so i'm curious like what your experience was yeah i was um definitely for it for sure in the beginning like you get mm -hmm. it offered a record deal say like, oh okay this is like this is i've made it right it's like another like, version yeah. of making it like whatever like that means i'm sure we'll talk about that more later but but it didn't quite turn out that way 
like you get the you get some money you get like ten thousand dollars to make that and you do this and you and they had a factor like anything they would do they'd get approved by factor through mm-hmm. network records so i could make some videos i could you know fund some bigger recording sessions and stuff like that so i feel like in those kind of situations you find a champion within your the group of people that are working at the the label that love what you're doing they're your champion they want like want to like push you forward so i had some people within that organization that wanted to champion me which was nice because it wasn't pop music so i wasn't selling a ton of records but they still believed in in the heart of my music if that makes sense it could be yeah. something special there so you know ult- ultimately i've made two records with that label and then got dropped, which really hurt because oh. they they were changing directions into more like alt country kind of stuff, like which was not what I was doing at all. So <laughs> whatever, you know, it's like a great experience. And in hindsight, I'm really I wouldn't change anything. I feel like I was supported by most of the company, and it was exciting to have a record deal and the publicist and do all these really cool tours and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that was. I really another like the early days of being in band in college was awesome and then being in a band with, with my own material and be able to tour with a deal and stuff like that was also really special and precious so yeah i don't feel jaded by being dropped by a label i feel like i'm mm-hmm. really grateful for those experiences to get to that point and and really proud of those that stuff i was doing so yeah yeah, yeah that's so cool. i would say i would say more pro yeah <laughs> but that was back then right so that's like quite a few years ago and mm-hmm. things have changed a lot now so right yeah, yeah the industry is always it's always changing yeah yeah so then film scoring and stuff so was it that you got most of your work licensed first before you came on as composers for as a composer for these shows and stuff yeah definitely that was the way i got into it um making that kind of music which was a little bit more uh ambient with some beats and stuff like that so it lent itself really well to being placed on the radio in a cafe or like Mm -hmm. in a lounge or whatever just like something to like hang my hat on as far as like getting a licensing fee and you know they don't they don't pay a ton but it's like getting your foot in the door right which is really really great so i remember getting a few like pretty good contracts that people like for a show, one show called bitten that turned out to do quite well. And I got lots of, uh, um, interest in this one song I did. So called, it was called flutter by, and it was in a, it's like a vampire kind of movie, a TV, okay. TV series, I should say. So I just thought it was like, Oh, this is like really interesting to have my music out there like that and have that, um, get some traction right so then it kind of occurred to me that maybe i should start composing some music that would maybe feel like it would work for that kind of stuff but not having an agent not having you know any anywhere to really like i didn't know how to do it like where to go with it i just had a music uh supervisors coming to me saying hey we like that song let's license it okay so that's Mm -hmm. all i kind of knew and then um it's always like a bit of a fear of of being busted too. Like the more I did, like by <laughs> busted, I mean like because I don't read music. I have mm-hmm. no like I can I can look at a like really basic someone that wrote music for someone who's one year old or like a like <laughs> a to- toddlers and like little like kids. I can I can kind of make it. I can figure it out. Mm-hmm. But I just had this feeling like oh I'm not good enough. I'm not cool enough to do. Yeah. To, to be a composer right i just say I don't. The, the imposter syndrome <laughs> that's it it was so rampant it was like mm. it was like a little like blaring in my head but i knew mm. that i just i love to make music and i and i know when I, i'm making something that feels right to me the hair on my neck stands up and just have that thing where it's just like oh you just what is what's happening right now you don't really don't don't need to label it but it's something special mm-hmm. so um what happened was did the licensing stuff i had the band stuff going in my in the past and did the record deal stuff um a friend of mine his name's david ray he 
is a great uh, director and writer and just incredible creative. He was making a movie called Grand Unified Theory. And he came to me and he's like, hey, Mesh, I'm making this movie. It's called Grand Unified Theory, and I want you to do the score for it. And I, and I just immediately felt like a cold sweat. I'm like, <laughs> ah, I don't know if I can do this. I don't think I'm the right person, Dave. Like, I know. Like, thank, thanks for asking. And he just could see me kind of like getting amped up. And he just like calmed, calmed me down and said, Hamish, I, I really love what you do. Like, I don't care if you can read music. I don't care about anything other than the fact that I love the heart in your music. So and he said, this is like one of my, he's done, he did one other indie film, but this was like his next level of, of filmmaking. And he's like, well, let's just do this together and like make it really fun and, and support each other through it. So I said, yes. And it was, I also have something like there's the dyslexia part, which I've, you know, you find a way to like make it work, right? It's like, I, I can get, go through life and. I use voice to text a lot and uh, it helps me with trying to like, spell stuff all the time. And so mm -hmm. there's, you have tools, right? But I also have something known as synesthesia, which is where yes. when I'm in a, a forest or I see colors, I hear frequencies mm -hmm. and they're really loud to me. And I just thought it was something that everyone had. And I remember talking to my mom when I was, Pretty little. It's like, why does it forest sound like this? And she thought I was talk, <sighs> talking about the the wind or like the trees, like the leaves blowing, stuff like that. But I was hearing more a frequency. Or when I would see going to somewhere where it was like a lot of red or a lot of whatever the color would, I'd just be overwhelmed by a. It's almost like a a frequency hug in a weird kind <laughs> of way. It's like just like oh, it's like it's just like it just like overtook oh. me. It was like really cool. So. I have that within me as well. And I always thought that was something to be ashamed of. I didn't oh. want people to know, but it, apparently it's a thing. So like lots of people have different, different forms of synesthesia. Um, so anyways, when David had asked me to do this score, I had just quit my day job. So I had a full-time day job for like 10, 12 years, like working at a, a lighting company. It was awesome. I could be in this it was a small company. I could go there. I could work. I could go on tour. My boss was just <laughs> incredible and lots of artists would work there. But it came to a point where I, I felt I needed to, to trust my intuition and trust that do, somehow doing music full time was my path. I didn't really know what that looked like at the time. So I had read this book called The Alchemist. I'm not sure if you've, you've read that yeah. book or not, but it had a really big impact on me to just what I took from that book was to not live your life all the way and save, 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 and then do something at the end of your life, like to take a trip when you retire. That's going to be the magic part. So work hard to like save and then do the cool stuff. I like let's just do the cool stuff all the time. Let's like make it part of my my daily routine to be to tap into magical stuff and find a way to trust that that's the right thing to do. So I read that book and it inspired me to quit my day job after all these years. So at the time I had two kids and a house that was just being renovated. I was married and I remember coming home and Talking to my wife at the time and saying, I need to quit my job. And I need to like, she was like, now? Like, <laughs> I was like the house is like half torn apart. I've got two little kids. I'm like, I just, oh, no. I've been being called. And there's a calling here <laughs> <laughs> to, to quit the job. So anyways, I, I, I did. I quit that job and I just wow. <laughs> trusted that music's going to be it. So shortly after is when David came to me to say, mm -hmm. I've got this movie and it's called Grand Unified Theory and it's going to be filmed in chapters and each chapter is going to be f um, following the evolution and stages of alchemy. And can you compose each chapter in the color of each stage of alchemy? And I was like, inside, I was like, no, I can't do this. And I was like, the more he would tell me, like, I was like, I don't care if you can read music. 
I could care less. And it's also going to be filmed in color frequencies. Each like each chapter was like all red and like all turquoise, like people's glasses and the stuff in the background would be kind of color coded oh, too. Yeah. So I was like, how could I say no to like co- composing and do color frequencies? Yeah. And like, yeah. And then, then he's like, okay, can you do choir music? in latin <laughs> like, oh <laughs> like, and like the answer is always yes so like mm. you google translate and oh wow and it was a great experience and it was like we did the the indie film circuit and did quite well have you ever watched yeah. other films or movies that are also like a similar concept where like with the synesthesia thing where they have you know different frequencies because it's different for every person right like it is yeah yeah so if you watch that does that feel like really odd for you if if their interpretation or like the color and the frequency that is shown is different from what you hear and see it does feel a bit weird for sure (laughs) um but like i totally understand that it's different for them that's their experience so like i totally get it but for me to hear like hey they're seeing red and they're hearing the the note whatever it could be C I'm like ah but I hear G my God this is not working for me or whatever <laughs> but yeah. yeah just just interesting for sure yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah, um just curious <laughs> yeah yeah no doubt so the journey after making that film I uh, had quit the day job I had read The Alchemist I'm like on this new path um, my mom had passed away this went going mm-hmm. back to 2010 my marriage at the time had broken up i was like on this path of you know like trying to figure out where i was at you know two little kids and mom had passed by i was like really close with her marriage dissolved then i was like making music in my own new a new space i had a studio at home before at the old house but so it's just trusting like it's a building community through teaching music and and i hadn't really started composing full time i did the one film that was kind of my my introduction to like actually composing i had no idea what i was doing i just did it. i just did it but um yeah. <laughs> so it was interesting because my dad was a high school teacher and i always felt like i'd never want to be like my dad i don't don't want to be a mm. high school teacher i don't want to be a but then here I am, I was like teaching all these kids about the magic of music and it wasn't drum lessons or piano lessons or bass lessons. It was more like, how did these all talk together and how, mm. what, what's, and sometimes we just come in here and watch videos of, of the who and Keith, <laughs> Keith Moon blowing up his drum set and these kids like, what is this? It's like, so awesome. It's like, that's the power of music, right? It's like, oh, it's, fun. it's not just about like learning your scales. Yeah, being inspired right so anyway so what was happening was in in west vancouver is where the studio is a director was lives close by he was bringing his daughter here to take lessons and um his name is martin and martin said oh i heard you did a an indie film i'd, I'd love to have a have a look at it and and uh so I said, yeah, well, for sure, man. Like, here, here you go. <laughs> and he had done stuff like Stargate and, you know, like some pretty cool stuff back in the day and uh, lots of, you know, bigger TV stuff. This is going back, what, seven, eight, nine, nine years ago now. Um, anyways, he took that film and he really loved my music. He really felt something within my score. So um, he came back and said, like, Hamish, I really love what you did and i was like really like oh thanks martin like because i didn't really know like all his work so so but he really took it to heart and he i don't know like there's something the way i make music and from my my past musical uh influences are similar to his so he heard something mm-hmm. with what i do um so he was starting a new series called chesapeake shores for hallmark and he said to me, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, I've, I've got a new series coming up. And yeah, that, he kind of left it at that. So <laughs> behind the scenes, he's going to the president of Hallmark and all these people and saying, yeah, I found the composer for Chesapeake. This is the brand new series. And they're like, that's great. 
Martin, who who is it? <laughs> His name's Hamish, and he's from North Vancouver. And they're like, who? <laughs> what has he done? He did Grand Unified Theory. It's like, what is that? <laughs> 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 what even is that? They had no idea. So he had to, you know, like, say, no, trust me. I feel like this is the right person for this job, right person for this job. And eventually he was like a dog with a bone and they said yes. So um, Martin convinced them to say yes. So I had no idea this was happening behind the scenes. And um, I'm mm. living my life. I've got, you know, son, I've got a daughter. I think it's all like, you know, like five and eight years old kind of thing. And what happened was, you know, a few, actually not five and eight, um, like more like 13 and 11. Um, Martin convinced them. And what happened was I have a, a situation where my, my son passed away. So at the, just after his 14th birthday and by total, like uh, a shock to me, shock to the family, the way it unfolded, it um, happened by way of suicide just after his 14th birthday. Mm. And what happened was the next day I get this phone call from someone. My life's like upside down. And I saw my phone ring. It was a music supervisor that I knew in town. Her name's Dawn. And I really appreciate this woman. She had no idea. She picked up the phone. I picked up the phone and she's like, Hey, Mesh, I've got some great news for you. How are you doing? Like, oh. you've, been, you've been chosen to, make, to, to be the composer for this new series. And I'm like, I didn't know what to say. Like, I was just... I was I was just really really just paralyzed, mm. and I said that said well my like, my son actually just passed away like yesterday and she yeah I just like oh my gosh I was, well take your time as much time as you can to reflect like you if you can't do this it's totally okay mm-hmm. and I just I just felt like this was like a sign somehow that I like the universe acts in such a mysterious way that I I just had a feeling that the timing was for me to say yes to this job. And even though I, I had no idea how to deliver music to a, a TV network or how to like how it all worked. I did the one indie film with my buddy, which was like hanging out with your, your one of your best pals and just <laughs> making music, making fun, making art. So it was different. So anyways, I, I wound up saying yes. And within two weeks after Lachlan had passed, I found myself in these meetings of, of like doing spot sessions. I think I didn't even know what a spot session was. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you, how do, what, how do I deliver files? How do I, I didn't even know how to make a screener, like how to make a little quick time video of, the music. So anyways, I, I remember just trusting the sign from the universe that this is the right thing to do. And I said yes. And within a couple of weeks, I was in my studio, this very seat. Mm. And not, not like feeling so raw and like crying so hard, plugging in my gear. I couldn't even see it. And then as soon as I pressed play on the first scene, I felt like I just became a conduit. I'm not saying I'm like a conduit of, of my son or anything. I don't, I don't know what was happening. I just got into that emotion of whatever was happening in that scene. And I just poured everything into it. And then with making music for film and TV, the next scene is going to be way different. It's like going to be like, the grandma shows up and then this one's going to be a kid's birthday. This one's going to be like a little like kissing scene with whatever. It's like, you just need to be like in that moment with each scene. So for whatever was happening with me at that time, I was so grateful to have this, these scenes to 
pour my emotion into. Wow. And it, because a lot of people would maybe journal or like, but for me, music's my, my outlet. So mm -hmm. I don't, so I felt like it was a really incredible opportunity for me to work through some emotions yeah. um, as I was struggling through such a, such an incredible loss. Right. Yeah. Um, but like, not as you were saying with like how there are so many different scenes. And they're all different emotions. Like there are some really happy ones and some really probably sad ones. Yeah. How I would imagine like with all the grief that you're going through, how it would be easier to pour everything into all the sad scenes. But for all the happy scenes, I guess, was it still the same? You just you you just had so much to give and it yeah. worked. <laughs> you know what? That's I don't know how I did it. Like I look back now and I listen to some of those cues i did from the first episode of season one and there's a lot of funny stuff in those <laughs> scenes like quirky like there's like some there's a family show and sisters that were quirky and so there's a lot of humor and i i had no idea how to make a, a humor cue for tv anyways i had no idea how to like what was the typical sound of a tv cue i just mm -hmm. did what i felt sounded right which is part of why I got hired because Martin trusted. He loved what I, what I do. He loves what I do. So, um, it was definitely easier to tap into the more emotional content in mm -hmm. some way. But if I could, if I got too deep into certain content, you know, I would need to take a break. Need, mm -hmm. to, need to kind of ground myself in a in a way. But did somewhat... you also? Sorry. <laughs> oh no, the the humor stuff was was kind of a, a nice reprieve as well mm -hmm. like to kind of take my mind into something else for half an hour you know mm -hmm. yeah did you have any time to just make music for yourself then during this no no not all not, into the show all into the show yeah at this point i did mm -hmm. find some time down the road to to make my own music which was great really appreciate that time but for whatever reason Chesapeake Shores came up at that time for me to pour in my emotion into what I was going through. And I'll never forget that experience. The show just ended. This this was the last season just a few months ago. Yeah. So which was kind of like after seven years. I believe in seven year cycles. Like mm -hmm. you go through stuff in seven years, you do a change. Seven years and you shed your skin, you do something else. So this was another seven year cycle for me. Mm. I really uh yeah really, congratulations really. oh thanks thanks it was a yeah. big big deal for me for sure and yeah so what happened was like going through the first couple of episodes because you usually film in blocks which is like episode one and episode two together they would say okay make all the music and then you you get notes so that the, you get feedback from people but i think they they gave me a little space you know, in hindsight now to knowing what I was going through, I really respect the, all the people that were working on that show to give me such compassion and be some empathy towards what I was going through. But also yeah. the film and TV industry is like really hard edged too. And there, there's deadlines, you got to get shit done. But I was also having this, so I brought this like the softness to this like production like, and so they had to like, what do we, how do we deal with this composer? Like, okay, we need to give him a bit of space, but we also need to like, let him know that there's a deadline. So, right. And so that it was interesting to kind of, uh, reflect on that. Um, mm -hmm. so I had no idea, like I said before, I have no idea how, to, I had no idea how to make a quick time video as a music screener to show people here's what i'm working on here's how the music goes within these scenes and, it's like, and so i would just send them the music so they'd like oh we really like the music but it'd be really nice to see it paired with the actual visuals and the scenes and, and i just couldn't i couldn't do it at that time i just didn't know when i was so wrapped into what was happening in my life um that they were okay with me presenting the music right to the mix stage so like mm. we've gone through the episodes everything's been approved they love the music but they had no idea how it went with the actual oh, stuff yeah. so what happens is when you go to a, a, a mix playback so you're in a 
pretty big studio. There's a, someone mixing dialogue and sound effects and, and the Foley and all that stuff. There's a table of people with, with headlamp uh, uh, lights on their <laughs> pads of paper and they press play and they, they take notes on the, the music, the dialogue, the anything like they just, this is the last opportunity for people to make some kind of uh, comment before it goes on to the network on, on mm-hmm. air. So I remember sitting there, no one had heard the music with the visuals. The room's dark. There's probably like 20 people in the room. It's like the first couple episodes of this new series. And I, I'm like, fuck, I'm going to get busted. Here we go. This is like <laughs> another opportunity for me to get busted. Oh. And they're, they're going to hear. And I was like, is it normal to like sweat from your palms like this? It's like dripping sweat. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I'm like freaking out over here. And they played the episodes. And I could see people writing a bunch of stuff down. And I'm sure they were writing music sucks why would they put music here <laughs> like <laughs> but i remember getting through the the episodes and the room was totally silent and and then i just remember like, like around the room like people started clapping like just like pop almost <laughs> like popcorn plop, 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 plop. and i was like cheering and like, i was like oh my god the, the game ash you did it like this was like so amazing we've never heard anything like it because i had no experience of how to make tv music they heard Mm -hmm. like something coming from my heart of like oh it's like such a a raw experience and but still is feeling oh they just feel sorry for me they just like (laughs) i just couldn't couldn't shake the imposter syndrome i just yeah anyways so so that went great and they the the series Uh has done super well and after that, the, the phone started ringing. Like, it just started getting more, more work, more work, more work. So I've done, like, you know, 50, 60 movies now, and series, seven. Yeah, whole, just tons of stuff. So, and I'm so grateful for all those early stages of people, like, being, being uh, okay with me not knowing. You know, cut my teeth doing stuff mm-hmm. with Hallmark, right? So, like for what it's worth, it, there's some great stuff in there to to learn how to how to make music in a like a like I've done a score a whole score for a a TV movie in six days, and that's like really wild to that's wow. like what like but actually it kind of works for me to yeah. to not worry about like technical process but more relying on my intuition. And trusting yeah. that that's the right thing to do and just running with it. But it's important to have those discussions of, of uh, when you do the spot session beforehand. Like what kind of sounds, what's the palette, sound palette, um, what's the flavor of the movie before you mm-hmm. get going. Maybe show a couple of quick demos to people. But there can be times when you're making a movie where there's a lot of back and forth between producers and the network and there's a lot of armchair music critics out there (laughs) which is fine i think music's like a great uh, medium for people to want to comment on but Mm. it can be kind of tough on a composer when you have a really tight deadline so it's important to know who makes the final call so they they, lots of people chiming in like oh this Mm. is a great piece of music can you start it here this feels too fast. Can you do this a little bit more like whatever, whatever, like the little tweaks, but then they could get the pyramid Then you get to the person at the top who actually makes all the decisions. So it's important mm. to know who that person is and hear everyone and uh, understand that it's just being part of a team. Mm. The, the music's not, it's not the most important thing. It's, it's mm. just, it's just not I think the most important thing is the, in my opinion, at least, is is the connection between the actors and the dialogue and that emotion and the, everything around there as far as the, the lighting and the editing and the music and the foley is all to support that, right? So it's all part of, like, a big picture. So I have lots of opportunities where people don't like the piece of music I met, I made for a certain scene. And, I've, and I was like, I'm so excited to show you this piece of music. I really... And they're like, well, you kind of missed the mark on that one. And we feel mm-hmm. like it could be a little more this or that, which is completely fine. It's just their opinion. And so I have a, a folder on my computer, the, the land of misfit cues. 
<laughs> and they always find a home. It's like, it's really beautiful. Aww. I've got all these cues that I poured my heart into. And I can just grab it, throw it into another movie. And it's like, God, oh, it, wow. worked. it worked for that scene. I knew it would. Oh, yeah. that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's not just like a song graveyard. <laughs> nope. <laughs> De- definitely not. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to kind of have this. I'm just so grateful that I get to make music on this level as my career. And my daughter, she's turning 18 this week. She plays bass and she's Ooh. totally into music. She's a wicked bass player. And the thing is, I, I have music around me all the time, obviously, but I've never tried to force it onto my kids and, and, mm-hmm. and Sky now. This feel like if she wants to do it, she'll do it. And she's totally picked up the bass which is great. So sometimes we jam together in the studio and it's, oh, it's really fun. Funny. But it, I, what, what I really appreciate is, is me following my heart and doing this career and just have her witness, witness that and your dad and her dad, like making, making it happen, make, like making it, yeah. make, making it right. Like <laughs> making, with, it. making it with, with what I do. And um, so it's nice for her to see that me following my heart and then nice to see her now like being into music too like yeah yeah, it's pretty fun yeah yeah you seem to be somebody who has so much trust in the process and like you know trust in the universe and that just seems so hard (laughs) to do and um we kind of talked about this on another episode with kate mcgill because she was going through the loss of her mom at one point and there's a lot of grief surrounding that, obviously, and but she yeah. also is just like very trusting in the process. And yeah. I remember asking, like, how do you still have hope? How can you still hang on to hope when you've experienced such a loss and and like you've lost not only your son but like lots of other people as well, right? And mm-hmm. so, yeah, how do you hold on to hope and? How do you just trust the process? I guess that's it's it's really a difficult mindset for people to get into. Yeah, I think that's a really really great thing to ponder. Um, I I think I need to go back to when I was a kid and having a a, a reading disability and not being able to do math, and I just found ways to cope and find found ways to to persevere in situations where could have gotten me down. So Mm -hmm. in, in the core being of my body, I'm an optimistic person. So that's like, that's kind of like my foundation. I'm a loving optimistic person. So I can find hope and the positive in weird shitty situations. Yeah. You know, and I, I can I can have fun going to London drugs and like just going normal shopping. Like you just, you just have fun with it. Like you just find like, like why, why stress about certain things? So to, to have hope after such incredible loss, I think I can feel, I can tap into stuff. I can tap into memories of my son, memories of my dad, memories of my, my mom, other, other people that have, past Mm. so i feel it's like an honor to carry on from like the most heart-centered spot in their honor but doing it for myself because i know that's what they would want for me to find that spot where i'm just really like embracing the gifts that i have not worrying that i used to think they were um something that might hold me back so I'm tapping into my gifts, tapping into like what I have to offer this world. And that means like I can I can score really well. I can I can tap into emotional scenes because that's my use my intuition. And I don't worry that I can I'm not playing the right scale. I was like, that just feels like the right thing to do in that scene and to support the dialogue, support. So tapping into whatever like my mom and dad passed on to me as far as the I feel like That's it's beautiful. like c- continuing on like that that the thread right so like 
by me composing music, I can feel my mom coming out. I can feel my dad. I can obviously feel my son come through. You know, I feel like it's like just continuing an extension of the the physical connection into a realm where we can't see it wow. anymore, but we can just feel it. So it gives me a good, it allows me to connect to them too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So get like I have like it, it's, hope is a is an odd word for me. Like when I'm mm. thinking about people I've lost, but because I know that I have a way of connecting with them, not just through music. I have I dream about them, mm. and things show up the next day physically, which is like really trippy. <laughs> like yeah. I, have, I have this like it's like just a different relationship now. Wow. So that that's like also gives me an opportunity to trust the relationship is now something I can't see and I can't mm. touch. But unless it's something but I it's dream still about, there. but it's still like really tangible, you know. Huh. And like, so that really helps me get through those moments when. Uh, also, there's moments when I'm scoring, and it's really tough. Mm. So I've got some friends of mine that are composers and. I know if I, I hit a, hit a wall and I just can't do it, it's like, I just, which I haven't, haven't had that experience yet, but I know I can call on someone and I, there's no shame in asking for help. Mm. You know, if I feel like I'm in a spot where I'm just like too vulnerable, too, too raw to do a certain scene, I can call my buddy Matt and just say, Matt, can you help me with this? Mm. He'd be like, Right there. Wow. So it's just like, yeah, I used to feel like I needed to do everything myself, but it takes a community sometimes. Right. You know, it takes like people to lean on and people lean on me too. So I yeah. am such a person who does every single thing by myself. And yeah. it's, uh, I have been starting to work with other people and, and stuff, which has been nice. They take the load off, but good. I do, I find myself retreating back to being alone <laughs> and mm. doing everything myself <laughs> yeah i i actually love love that i love solitude mm. so i'm i'm cool with that but i i'm also okay with asking for help mm -hmm. so sometimes when i have uh like really really intense schedule like doing multiple movies and a series all at the same time and I have my daughter with me. She's with me part time. I get up at three in the morning, four in the morning. I go to the studio and record and compose until noon because she's a teenager. She sleeps till noon, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> so I, I come home after working like a, a full day and then she gets up. And we hang out and have a day together and add, have that balance. Right. Like have like mm -hmm. the work and then have like uh, really loving relationships your family and your partners and stuff outside of your work and then that kind of fuels it um so i love that solitude like mm -hmm. i love those moments of being alone just being in that space like creating and and it's interesting though when i'm scoring i don't feel alone because i'm with the characters right i'm with whatever's happening i'm with that 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 scene where they're giving a hug or they're they're laughing so i'm like i feel like i'm part of that i'm just like just yeah i don't feel like completely alone that's cool yeah yeah <laughs> so what does community look like for you i feel like like within my life it's having people that you can rely on and they can rely on you to show up for each other however mm -hmm. that looks like each relationship's different like it's all uniquely one one buddy may want to just hang out and sit in silence one person may want to like go and like play ping pong and like have a laugh right. but as far as like with this my creative community i love sharing what i do i love having people come into my studio and showing them what i do there's there's no secrets we could have the exact same software exact same instruments exact same footage and the score is going to be completely different so mm -hmm. I'm not like worried about like someone stealing my ideas. Like they're my like they, they come from me. Whatever someone else is going to do is going to come from them. So I love building community and and I remember when wondering like how do you make how do you do the score? How do you what do studios look like? How do 
And then I had some friends that would invite me into their spaces and they show me what they did. So now I love showing people what I do Mm -hmm. and building that, like propping people up and not like build community, not competition. You never know. You never know how things are going to unfold. Right. So I wound up doing a co-composing the last two seasons of chess speak with a good friend of mine. And we're both composers. We both get similar gigs, but say let's work together. And, and it's, it's great. So it's a feeling of community. Like I can call on some people when I need help. People can call on me when they need help. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's being in a place where someone can rely on me and I can rely on them and mm-hmm. help, help each other elevate elevate each other emotionally and physically and however way to say this lift each other up that feels like community to me yeah that's beautiful yeah. what is your the favorite part of your studio <laughs> you got a lot that's, of stuff going on <laughs> and this is all you can see in this this one picture oh uh, it's it's interesting i uh i have the thing where i love to collect stuff it doesn't have to be like the the best piece of gear it can be the best memory, the best experience mm-hmm. of like collecting something. So I've got amps, I've got little like noisemakers, like little stuff. So it depends on what I'm doing. So I don't have a favorite thing. Um, one thing I do have, if you can see in the background, the drum set back there. Mm-hmm. It, um, it's kind of an interesting story. It, it was a birthday present for me when I turned... 40 maybe I think my wife at the time she said hey we've got we've got to go somewhere we've got to go up to like upper north Vancouver area and we drove up there and the car pulled up and she says actually just get out and go knock on that door and um we'll, we'll talk to you in a little bit I had no idea so I closed the door I'm like what are you talking about and she just drove away. I'm like, fuck. Okay. Oh. So like, oh, bye. All right. So I like went up and knocked on this door and this amazing man like opened the door and he's like, he's probably like 80, 85 maybe at the time. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you must be Hamish. My name's Al. I think we have something in common. We both love drums. So come on in. <laughs> so what had happened? Like, uh, he he had ms and mm. a f- our friend's mom had ms and they were in a support group together got talking about music and thought that oh like hamish should meet al al johnson so like this is that's how it happened so i knock on the mm. door al answers the door and he said come on in and we became like really good pals talking about just music. And he would show me these old books of, of, there used to be a club in Vancouver called The Cave, which is where Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Buddy Rich, like all those bands would play. And he would mm-hmm. show me like these, these photos of, of oh. him. It's like, is that, is that Bob oh. Hope? Are you with Bob Hope? He's like, yeah, that's, oh, Bob, he's a real card. And so we would just have him share all these stories and, one day he he said, "Hey, do you want to see some of my drums?" So we go down to his, his crawl space and and mm-hmm. found this this kit, which is a nineteen early nineteen fifties Gretsch mm. drum kit. And I was like, "Oh my god! Like you have this drum set?" And it's like, "Oh yeah, that that was the house kit at the cave." I'm like, oh my god, what? It's like so all those bands use this kit, like. Duke Kelly did oh. Count Ella Fitzgerald's band. Like Buddy Rich has played this kit. <laughs> and so he, he, wow, well, like basically I said, Al, uh, do you ever think that you'd want to sell that drum kit? <laughs> He's like, why would you want that old thing? It's like, wow, well, it's just got so, it was just sitting there in a dusty corner in his crawl space. And I checked with his family too. And they were like, yep, cool. Like he, he would be happy to sell it to you. Yeah. So <laughs> anyways, I, I offered him like 500 bucks, I think at the time. And, wow. um, so I remember taking that to my studio straight from his house and had a, a leather bass drum skin into the studio and doing a session. It was a December night. It was snowing. 
So I would say that's one of my favorite things in my studio, having that piece of history back here. And that is of, so cool. A lot of my buddies are like, what are you going to do with that drum set? It's like, I am going to play the shit out of that thing. I love it. It's like, <laughs> that's why I have it, because I want to play it. So mm. I'm not going to put it in a museum. So, mm. yeah. That so I, I love amazing. that. Love that. I've got my, <laughs> my dad's old banjo. I uh, recently bought a couple of timpani, 1929 Ludwig and Ludwig <laughs> timpani. Like, you just can't oh. say no to that kind of stuff. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, when I'm doing scores, I just, you know, I love to, I have everything ready to record. It's like, just boom, like, have that moment. It's like, do like a synth thing, do the timpani, do, I've got a piano in the back. It's, it's awesome. The vibraphone. Yep. You have like everything mic'd up back there as yeah. well. Yeah. Wow. Everything's <laughs> ready to go. It yeah. looks also like it's not a terrible mess of cables. <laughs> <laughs> so that's well, you great. Can, you can't see the floor, like, but it's pretty, pretty good. It's pretty, pretty decent. Yeah. So I, I, lo <laughs> I love having this space. It's like my, my little playground. And it's like I said before, it's not coming to work. Mm. You just yeah. get, get to come here and, you know, I have. My my daughter comes here with her pals sometimes, which is super fun, and do some recordings, and we, yeah, it's just great to have the space and and do lots of scores. I have a new thriller coming up, which is going to be fun. So, Ooh. yeah. Do you have like a favorite genre to score for? Yeah, I would say the 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 dramatic stuff, which is not necessarily a thriller, not necessarily a horror, not. Like a romantic comedy, I've done mm -hmm. them all, but mm -hmm. something where it's a little more um, psychological, heartfelt, dramatic, with a little bit of humor sometimes, mm -hmm. but more tapping into the that stuff like the heart connection and the the love and loss kind of stuff, and yeah. maybe maybe like psychological m mystery kind of stuff too, yeah. for sure. Like you can get a like more more textural synth kind of stuff. That works mm. but yeah i would say that's kind of more my my zone mm. yeah also oh, like when you're because of all these deadlines and stuff and they're quick turnaround in times right for tv shows especially yeah are do you feel good about every single score that you give that you submit or or do you have to just kind of just let go of some of them and accept that it's good enough that like the directors producers they think it's good yeah so it has to be good enough. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's a good question. I feel like sometimes when there's the score that has six days or or just like one week to do a whole score, I need to mm -hmm. go a little bit quicker for sure. I might not have the opportunity to bring in a, a string section or I've worked with orchestras before and those that's just not going to happen for those kind mm -hmm. of things. So that's part of trusting your instinct and intuition in those those cues and to have your sound palette really dialed so when you're in it you know it's going to sound nice and rich you're going to have like the textures so i would say not every cue i've ever made is like this is it like this is like the most incredible thing there's going to be some more like the little transition pieces like you put your heart into it obviously i would never submit something where i didn't feel like it was from the heart and tapped into what I was seeing and feeling. Maybe not have the the time to hire or do like a bigger session for that cue, but still be able to convey the emotion and feeling within that cue with what I've got. So, mm. yeah, I, I do my best though to give and present stuff that I feel really good about and love yeah. and be okay with them saying we don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, then it goes into the misfit cue folder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That folder is so cute. <laughs> yeah. Were you working on different like films and stuff while you were doing Chesapeake Shores? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Lots how'd, of. How'd you balance that? <laughs> um, I think it goes down the, the same road of being able to tap into different scenes. It's like you have this scene, you're in it. Then you have this other scene, you're in it. You have this scene which happens to be a different movie with a different sound mm -hmm. palette, and you're in that. So I think for me, the ideal situation would be to have a full day to just be in whatever I'm doing, like be in with Chesapeake, be in a thriller, be in this 
rom com, whatever, whatever I was doing. <laughs> And then switch gears the next day, like to go back and forth within a day is not ideal. Just to, right. But to live in that world for a day would, works for me. Some, sometimes you get, you have to check your emails like, hey, we need X, Y, or Z for this series. But I'm scoring this other thing at the same time. So I, you have to, I have an assistant as well. So that helps to kind of manage yeah. that kind of stuff. So I think just carving out enough time where I feel like I can really embrace being in that movie. And also, Mm -hmm. I want, you know, like when I sign up for a job, I'm not going to sign up for like multiple movies just because I want to do them all. I want to feel like I can invest myself into them and not. And I also have to save time for my daughter, my partner, my, my family. So it's yeah. important to like not like burn the candle completely, which mm-hmm. does happen sometimes. But it's um, yeah, it's important to carve out that time to to live in that world where the producers and the director, and the network feel like they're being heard and you are yeah. you're fully on board in this film. But then I can change gears the next day. I can be fully on board in the other film while they're looking at the stuff I did for the other films. So it's like kind of like a bit of a balance for sure. Yeah. That works. Yeah. Hmm. Do you ever get like too emotionally attached to any one show or anything? Absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Sometimes you just feel a like character and you feel that and you just get so into it. And then you kind mm. of, yeah, I think it's just human nature to mm. yeah, yeah. connect with that, certain, certain scenes I, or whatever. I consider myself a very empathetic person. And so yeah. like sometimes it is hard to know where the boundaries are and when to stop feeling so much for <laughs> yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it comes down to building as the arc of a story as well. Like how much should I in time and emotion should I invest in this scene that I really love knowing there's another whole season of mm-hmm. scenes coming up and to, you have to have somewhere to build. And also not just musically, but for me, emotionally as a composer, like, I need to leave some, some room for some gas in the tank for what's, right. ha- what's happening down the road. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but having said that, it's, it's pretty amazing how I can recharge myself, mm-hmm. like just taking a five minute walk in the forest, <laughs> come back and I feel like I'm ready to go into the next. Mm next oh, wave of composing and feel recharged and refreshed and some breathing and exercise and sleep's important and, and good you know like good eating habits and you know at all yeah. when you're having a, a big intense schedule i think it's important to have that yeah foundation that's also too. when it's hardest though to where everything kind of falls apart right <laughs> yeah sure can it sure yeah. can that's where I make one meal at the beginning of the week. And like, it's like some people go to the gym. We're going to do mm-hmm. like meal prep. I was like for the, for the gym. It's like, <laughs> I'm doing meal prep to go to the studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which works for me. Right. It's like have something nourishing to have there to eat when you're in that moment where you might just want something quick. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Do you have like, do you schedule out your days then? Um, Is it very structured? No. But, I, but yes, if I have a schedule to like, if I have a meeting like with you yeah. or absolutely, it's like, like carve that time out to make it happen <laughs> for sure. But I like to leave room for spontaneous magic. Even if mm. I'm not like coming into the studio to score, I want to leave room for something to unfold that's inspiring to me. So I don't mm. over schedule, but I know if I have, obviously I've got a daughter in high school so i need to know like i gotta like i, I yes i have to keep a, a structure for sure but mm-hmm. l- i leave lots of room for the freedom for spontaneous stuff to unfold if yeah. that makes sense and that's how i score yeah. too and that's how I, I i carry myself like be in that moment and if it carries me away for a little while like that's great like, mm. i was able oh, to cool. tap into something so yeah when you get into the flow <laughs> yeah yeah music is so magical it's so fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah um has your songwriting influenced your composing or vice versa um in a weird kind of way like after the pandemic hit 
I had an, I had some space between my my composing world to tap back into my mm-hmm. songwriting, mm-hmm. like for like basic songs or whatever, like with lyrics and stuff like that. So at that point, that's when I first felt like there was an influence. I'd never felt like my there was a direct influence of my songwriting and producing into my scoring, but there must have been. Like obviously, if there was like an evolution to get there, so. But mm. I felt it really when I had a break, I had a, like you know a year where things were a bit you know wobbly for us all to mm. start making my own music music again, so I could tap into that process of a verse, a chorus, a bridge. It's like oh right, like there's like a structure for these things, <laughs> like um, but I could feel the the more. Uh, composer world clashing not clashing uh meshing i should say mm. with with that songwriting world for sure so i noticed yeah. that it's like oh i'm gonna make this extend this section a bit i'm gonna put these like a bit of a string string section in there which i wouldn't have done before and mm-hmm. so yeah definitely a bit of a crossover for sure oh, that's cool yeah I yeah think me too i think it's really cool should we get into some patreon questions sure yeah um, so Fong asked, how hard is it to create something under time pressure? Can you be as creative as with no pressure? Um, that's a really great question. I would say the way I'm wired, I can tap into being creative if I have five months for a score or if I have five days. So. The pressure mm-hmm. for me, like, if I have five months, I w- it would be different. I would have a, bit of a bigger team. I would probably hire an orchestra. It might be, like, a bit of a different thing. But the root of the, the creativity would not necessarily change. So I'd have mm-hmm. that, that feeling to write the music, get it out. So I wouldn't have that pressure. Whereas when I'm doing a score like a really really tight deadline i'm grateful that i'm able to tap into stuff and not worry about the technical stuff because i have like everything's wired up to to record like i said everything's good to go so whenever i have a moment and i want to capture it it's going to sound really great so Mm. yeah yeah it's efficient (laughs) yeah do you think that being able to tap into this tap into your creativity so fast do you think that that just came natural to you or is, was that something that came with practice by doing so many projects a bit of both i would say more that it came naturally for me as mm-hmm. a kid being dyslexic having to find different ways of overcoming obstacles mm-hmm. and using my brain in different ways so i could tap into and be being able to watch stuff for for patterns and people rather than trying to write it down and i would have to tap into more of like a a sensation and visual sensation and so bring that in rather than the technical stuff so Mm. i think since i was a kid more Mm. yeah when you're composing and writing or like working in your daw i'm thinking like like when you open up the midi editor Mm -hmm. and you've got all these different notes with the dyslexia does that affect that at all that's a question that I can't really answer. I don't know if it does. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I just know how, like, I deal with it. So yeah. the, you might deal with it completely different. But I do work well with, like, seeing a piano because it's like a grid. Mm. I can see it. So, like, when I'm looking at MIDI, I can see these chunks, and it's good for my brain and compute, like, what's happening really mm-hmm. quickly. So I find it kind of easy to do MIDI stuff okay. without actually overthinking it. I never overthink anything. Good. (laughs) Yeah. So, (laughs) Hmm. What are some common misconceptions with dyslexia? I think people feel like, from my own experience, I I can't speak for other people. I can only speak from what I've experienced, obviously. So Mm -hmm. people might think, oh, you're dyslexic, so you you can't read at all, or you're like not as bright, or whatever. Like it just felt like a bit of a stigma of being diminished um in in a way of like being in school and stuff like that but obviously i 
I've found a way to make it work for me. And I feel like it's a strength for me now. I used to think it was a weakness, but yeah, it's like, this is who I am. And I get to read a, a little hundred page book and I get to make that book like a 10 book, thousand page epic because I read it <laughs> so many times. <laughs> so it works for me. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. 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 It's cool. Cause yeah, as uh, we're, as I was, I was talking with Steven about, you know, we're talking about disabilities and how there's actually a lot that people don't see. Like pe- everybody looks fine on the outside, but you don't know what they're dealing with or how they, or how they, you know, go about the world yeah. in society. <laughs> I completely agree. It's like with, with mental health stuff, or it doesn't have to be with mental health, but looking at you right now, like, you might have other stuff on your mind or like walking down the street. Like I yeah. love smiling at people. Just, you never know like how, like what someone's going through. Like that's like, if I can spread a little bit of like my own personal love, mm-hmm. hold, I hold the door open for people when they're coming. It's like, I see a person like half a block away. It's like, they might be coming in this door. I'm going to hold the door open. <laughs> it's such a Canadian it's, thing. <laughs> it totally is. Hey, there are so many memes of that too. It's like, this person is so far away. You don't know when they're going to get here. Do you hold the door? You're already holding the door. If you leave now, they might like get there as the door's closing. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of thinking involved. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. But it, it, yeah. is, it is so true. You, you never know what someone's feeling or going through. You can Don't judge a book by the cover. Mm, That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember as a kid in the grocery store, I was just like sitting in the shopping cart and I think it was, I think we, we ran into our neighbors or something, but my mom was away from the cart and these neighbors came by and said hi and they just kind of like waved at me, smiled at me and I did nothing. I had a blank face <laughs> and I didn't know how to react. And then so I like told my mom after and she was just like, just smile at them. Why don't Aww. you can just smile at people? Yeah. And then so I started doing that. And then when people don't smile back, I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> like, why? <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah. some people don't smile back. That's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally okay. Yeah. Fong also asked, music has taken you many places. Which one do you cherish the most and why? Mm. It's hard. It's like kind of like trying to pick your, your favorite kid. Like all those places to me are like... <laughs> favorite for a certain reason like mm. my my time during uh college or, or even like go let's go back like my time being like seven eight years old in a pipe band like mm-hmm. incredible like cherish that time then being in college i cherish that time yeah record deals and touring i cherish and i cherish this time of scoring so it's it's really hard for me to pick one that would be that would win because I feel like they're they're all connected to making me who I am as to where how I got here. So mm. I'm gonna say I can't decide on which one would be my my favorite one because they're all so incredibly meaningful to me at, at where I was at in that time. Yeah. So I could say now is the most important time because, but it's like recency bias, right? It's like this mm-hmm. is happening now. <laughs> yeah. It's like all this great stuff, and I get to score for films and you know like have a a great life but when i was in college that was a great life too when i was Mm -hmm. touring like yeah yeah do you think your your college music education was helpful 100 what you do now oh yeah for sure Mm -hmm. i remember just because you're in it you're in it with these people that are all like striving to be a really good musician and you're building that community Mm-hmm. and practicing and i remember though when i left the last day like we we're done music school i was walking out the door and my teacher at the time one of one of my teachers his name was ihor kukuruza he yells at me he's like hey thompson now go on learn everything you've learned <laughs> and i'm like what do you mean by that what did he mean by that? It's like some kind of Yoda comment, you know? <laughs> but I, I get it now. It's like, go unlearn. Cause I just spent time like 
getting all this information, getting all like these technical skills and, and mm. his advice was to go out there and be me. Don't try and emulate someone that you've like been learning about for the past few years. Like go on, learn it all. Like just go do the best of being you, you can. I love that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Totally <laughs> stuck with me. Wow. Yeah. Um, from Chris. Oh, I guess we've talked about imposter syndrome. Um, Chris's question was, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? And if so, how has it impacted you and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I, we de definitely covered that, but just having the, the courage to be okay. When people ask you to do something, they're asking you to do something because they trust you and they love what you do. They're hiring you because they love your art, not mm -hmm. if you can read or if you can <laughs> do certain things. So, yeah, I think for me that that would be it. You know, it's trusting, trusting. We all have gifts. Mm. Like we all have gifts and they're not going to be the same. So my gift is probably different than Chris's and different than <laughs> yours. We all like have something really special to bring to the world. So trusting that that's, that's enough. Hmm. Is that enough? So. Yeah. It is. For me, it's enough. Now, in the early days when I had imposter syndrome that was like really heavy. Mm -hmm. I don't read music. You, you know, I, I did a score for Netflix. Hired an orchestra for the first time. Had no idea how to orchestrate. So I hired my friend mm -hmm. Serena, who's incredible to like help me like give all this music for an orchestra in Budapest. And like, and I thought that was another, wow. another like opportunity, like doing a Skype session with this orchestra and for me to get busted. Mm -hmm. But they're like, Oh, this sounds really good. We really like your score. And it's like, you do, but, 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 but I don't, but <laughs> so easy to tap into that. Um, wow. Yeah. Trust yeah. your, trust your gift. And people hire you because they, they, they're feeling what you're doing. Mm. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, just an another one from Chris is, what is your workflow like when it comes to producing albums when compared to composing for screen? Do you have a similar core workflow or are the challenges different or similar? That's a great question. I think with scoring for film, I'm part of a, usually a bigger team and there's hard deadlines. Like we need to have stuff like it's going on air at X, Y, or Z. So we have to have all the stuff done. So it's, it's kind of easier, even though it's like a lot more work sometimes to do a whole mm -hmm. score to have these deadlines. But when I'm producing music for other artists, like albums and stuff like that, most often there's not a hard deadline. It's like whenever mm -hmm. we get it done, then we'll figure out our release date and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a looser um schedule um and this it's a bit different if i'm working with just uh, an artist like a singer songwriter where i may do like the the music with them mm. that's one thing so it kind of ba you, you work a schedule it's like okay let's we have six songs we're gonna do a session every like twice a week and we'll, we'll have a goal like set a goal for sure i think goals are really important whether mm. you're doing like an indie artist or a band or the film score, like the film score stuff, there are goals there. Cause you just the way it is, you get a schedule, like that's the goal. Yeah. Um, but when you're working with an artist, you know, unless there's a, a label interested or going to be putting something out, then you'll have a hard deadline, but more often than not, it's, it's a bit looser. So I think it's important to create goals for sure. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. by the end of like within two months, let's have these six songs dialed and recorded and get them mm -hmm. out for mastering mm -hmm. yeah yeah cool um i guess to, to wrap it up then i've been asking this season um what does making it mean to you mm. that's an like, really incredible question because it's it's ever evolving for me mm. it's like going back to when i was a kid going to college 
my dad was pretty tough on me at times. Like there was a movie called Whiplash. I'm not sure if you've seen oh, yeah. that. <laughs> I watched that movie. And I was like, oh man, I feel like uncomfortable because that feels like kind of close to home, mm. but not like as not as like you know not the physical abuse, but like the emotional abuse is really intense. In that movie, but for me, it was, it was pretty intense mm. from my own experience with my dad, like really pushing me because he was a very like by the book um on a life on a grid and couldn't really understand how i could just feel stuff like, mm. like using my intuition and we would do pipe band competitions and the snare drum stuff and i i would often win i would i would win my whatever category i was in that you know i'd be like 10 11 12 13 14 kind of age range 15 mm. and i remember like and the winner is and then they would say my name and my dad would be like oh shaking his head i'm like what <laughs> he's like can you imagine if you practiced it's like but i, I but i won it's like kind of like <laughs> yeah sp- like spinal tap like goes up like there's no more black or like beyond 10 or whatever it's like but yeah. i but i won dad he's like but what if you practiced like but i would do do it my way and i could tap into something so he would always have this thing he would like when are you going to make it when i went to college i do Mm. all these years of being in bands and touring and so for him his idea of making it was i want to see your name on the cover of the rolling stone like that's that for him that was making it so for me like he ingrained that into me it's like oh like i or at least he tried to ingrain that in me it's like no dad like every stage of my career i feel like i get to the next level and i i starting to support myself i had a family i had the day job so I, when i read the book the alchemist and i was able to quit the day job finally emotionally and i was i was teaching music and producing i wasn't quite doing film scoring at that time mm-hmm. but i was making it work so yeah. and I told him, it's like that. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to make it. Like I am really proud of the fact that I'm doing music full time and I'm supporting myself and my family. And he's like, ah, but like, wouldn't it be nice to like see your name on the cover of like a magazine <laughs> or something like that? Mm. And then you know, I'd, I'd win some awards with a band. Say, like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, not bad, son. Like, but when are you gonna have your name on the cover of the Rolling Stone? And, <laughs> yeah. So anyways, to the fast forward a bit, when I started doing film scoring, he he watched the film on TV and it said music by Hamish Thompson. And that was it for him. It's like, hey. that was it for saying like, you made it, like high five at me. I'm like, dude, I've been, I've made it for years, man. Like, <laughs> the fact that my name's on TV now, like that, that does nothing for me. But, mm. you know, but personally to, to, make it means making music from the heart that connects with people and i can inspire my my daughter to see her dad following his dream and i also get paid for it like it's my career i get so like it's important right like to make it for me is like all encompassing of like music from the heart uh making music that connects with people and being being paid for it that's mm-hmm. part of making it, right? But if I didn't get paid for it, still, if I felt like I was making music that inspired people, that would feel like making it too. Mm. But from where I'm at right now, I feel like in a really nice sweet spot of all my past experiences, working through those emotions of what making it meant for my family and what it meant for me and right. to to have had the courage to quit my day job, to dive into music however that just trusting the unknown like what does it mean to Mm. make to make it i feel like a really grateful spot now yeah grateful the spot i'm in to to be able to create music every day and and inspire my daughter and make music that connects with people because i get keep getting hired which is great so i guess it's working (laughs) (laughs) and and, uh, i'm able to like not have a side job yeah, so I, yeah, I'm in a sweet awesome. spot. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Great answer. 
Um, where can people find you, your music online, or if they want to learn more about you? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, HamishThompson.com. H-A-M-I-S-H-T-H-O-M-S-O-N. No P. Dot com. Nice. That's, that's my website. And yeah, I'm on IMDb and stuff like that. So Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and of having this chat with me. Yeah. And sharing so much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I appreciate being on here. And like I said before, I really appreciate what you're doing. And it's a uh, building community. So I, yeah, I admire that. <laughs> thank you. We'll chat soon. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Yeah, bye. Bye.